Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Muhammad wa ahla baytihi tayyabina tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjal farajahum. <coughs> we left off talking about Yusuf alayhi salam and his uh, brothers when they came to visit him. And they swore that they would to their father, Yaqub alayhi salam, that they would bring Benjamin or Benjamin to Yusuf. And then that they would promise that he would, they would bring him back even if they were destroyed. Then something happened where uh, Yusuf kept Benjamin with him. They planted the king's goblet in his bag and they uh, made this as a something to keep him there. So now his brothers had to go back and face Yaqub and tell them what happened. So this is where we left off. He says, so nine of the brothers, they went back. They left Benjamin and Reuben behind. The Reuben, he said, I will not go because of the oath to my father that I will not return unless we are bring Benjamin or I am destroyed. So they were worried about facing their father when they got back and they got home and they tried to explain it to Yaqub, all the things that happened and they were telling the truth this time, but it's, you know, one too many lies, uh, you know, eroded the trust in them. We say like uh, the old fairy tale or fable that we have in, in uh, you know, the American stories, the boy who cried wolf. He cried wolf so many times and there was no wolf. Everyone came. And then finally, when the wolf did come, he, he cried wolf and no one came. So we see here that they lied before uh, so many times that uh, Yaqub, uh, you know, they told him that before with Yusuf, the, these lies. So now they have lost the trust. They don't have any trust in them. So in desperation, they said, ask the people who live in the city where we were and who traveled in the caravan with which we returned that we are telling the truth. Is it Surah 12, Ayah 82? Yaqub told them, it is not as you claim. Rather, you have fooled yourselves into doing something awful. It was not just that he did not trust his son's story. Rather, uh, he scolded them because they acted foolishly. First, they had not been smart enough to, you know, realize uh, that the presence of the goblet in Benjamin's pack was circumstantial evidence. It didn't prove that he stole it. It just happened to be there. Second, they had foolishly proposed a punishment. If enforced, it would go against the oath they made with their father. So they are the ones who made that um, punishment you say he said what is the pun what should be the punishment for one who steals and they gave the punishment themselves and that punishment would contradict the oath they made to their father third when benjamin was uh, detained uh, aside from reuben they all failed to fulfill their oath uh like their brother they should have stayed there they shouldn't have come back because coming back without Benjamin was a violation of the oath. Nonetheless, Yaqub once again submitted to these circumstances. And uh, he said, but grateful patience uh, shall be my motto. Perhaps Allah will bring them all back to me, for he is the all-knowing, the all-wise. This is Surah Yusuf, Ayah 83. So Yaqub, he never complained against uh, Allah. He said, beautiful patience is my way, but how quick are we when we get in difficulty or situation? The first thing we do is complain and we gripe and complain against Allah. Uh, this is something that we have to fight against and change in ourselves. And we have to say, Alhamdulillah, ala kulli hal. Praise be to Allah in all the circumstances. And we have to have trust in Allah. We see that Yaqub, Salam, now has lost two of his sons, but he puts the trust in Allah that he will bring them back to him. Yaqub pulled away from his sons and he went to mourn in, uh, for his loss while he was alone. And in prayer, he said, how do I, how I grieve for Yusuf? He wept for Yusuf and the trials and tribulations Allah had ordained for them until his eyes went blind from the sadness because uh, he could all but contain it. He said, Lord, will you not have mercy on me? 
you took my sight and you took my two sons. So we, we see here that, uh, <clears throat> um, for example, we see that Yusuf, uh, some people, they say, why do you cry for Imam Hussein, alayhi salam? As a side note on to this discussion, they say, why do you cry for Imam Hussein, alayhi salam? Why do you mourn for him? This crying and this mourning is uh, something, you know, that we shouldn't do and it's too, too much. And, you know, there all these things come around Muharram and these things. But look at Yaqub, alayhi salam. Yusuf was alive. And he cried for Yusuf so much that he went blind. This is a prophet of God the, crying for the loss, the separation. This is, if we see that a prophet does it, it establishes it as a sunnah of these prophets. And Allah does not condemn this in Quran, that he cried like this and mourned like this. It doesn't say that it is wrong. So therefore, we see that it is permissible to do that. And we see that uh, <clears throat> because some people are s say that, for example, we are, uh, everything has these limits, you know, and conditions. But some people say, oh, you are striking your chest for Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. This is causes harm to you or uh, this and that and all these things. But we see that uh, Yaqub, alayhi salam, cried until he went blind. We see Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam, our, our Prophet Muhammad, he prayed until his ankles would swell. So this shows that, you know, these things are okay, that there's nothing uh, wrong with that, <clears throat> that we, one can mourn and cry for the Imam Hussein Alayhi Salaam. And we see Yaqub cried for uh, Yusuf Alayhi Salaam. He says, Lord, will you not have mercy on me? You took my side, you took my two sons. Allah replied to him, even if they were to die, I would bring them back to life to bring you together. However, I have lengthened your separation to reprimand you. Do you remember that once you slaughtered a sheep and roasted its meat and ate it? There was a warfare who had been fasting, yet you didn't offer him any of the meat. To be reminded that he was cause of Yusuf's suffering only made his pain greater. Weeks passed and, you, and Yaqub continued to spend his time in private mourning. His sons still haunted by their age-old jealousy of their brother. They told Yaqub, they told their father uh, with spite. They said, by Allah, it seems you will never stop thinking of Yusuf and praying for his return until you ruin your health or you die. We see that they had enmity for Yusuf. So they're saying, all you're doing is thinking of Yusuf. You are going to cry so much until you are, it's going to ruin your health or you're going to die. Uh, they said that the book says that they had got rid of Yusuf, hoping that they could, uh, you know, get their father's attention at that point. But even in Yusuf's absence, the, his memory was over their thoughts, over Yaqub's thoughts. It reigned over his thoughts. And it gave him all his attention is now going to mourn over Yusuf. So he turned away from those brothers in remembrance of Yusuf. Yaqub, alayhi salam, he said, I only present my worries and my grief to Allah, who can answer my prayers, not to you, who the very source, you're the very source of my grief. So in these difficult situations, he turns his attention towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah is the one who can answer the prayers. It says Yaqub needed to know, he needed to be reassured whether Yusuf was still alive or not. So he called down the angel of death, Malakumaut. Uh, he said, to the angel of death, came to him in a nice form. He said, you know, uh, you know, like, I'm your servant. I'm at your service, basically. Uh, Yaqub said, tell me, do you personally take all the people's souls or are they taken separately by various angels of death? Maybe you are like the manager over all the other angels of death. He said, my helpers take them separately. But all people's souls are presented to me. 
Yaakov pressed and asked, if that is the case, then I ask you for the sake of the, the God of Ibrahim, Ishaq, and Yaakov, has the soul of Yusuf been presented to you? Angel of death said, no. So it was then that Yaakov felt certain that Yusuf was still alive. And it was hopeful that they would be reunited soon and that his prayers would be answered. So around the same time in Egypt, a villager came to Yusuf to buy the rations for his household. When he had picked his rations, he had packed those rations. Yusuf asked him, where do you live at? So he mentioned the town that he was from and Yusuf, uh, his eyes lit up, as they say. And he said, on your way there, you'll reach such and such valley. Stop and call out, Ya Yaqub, Ya Yaqub. An honorable and handsome man will answer your call. Tell him, in Egypt, I met a man who conveys to you his salam and says that the trust that you have given to over to Allah's care has not been forsaken. So this way, he, when Yaqub would get the message, he would know that it has come from Yusuf alayhi salam. So the villager, he went and did that. He did what Yusuf asked him. He delivered the message to Yaqub. No sooner had he heard the message of, of Yusuf, he fainted. When he awoke, he got himself together. He asked the villager if the, he had anything that he needed and anything that he could repay him for, for bringing this beautiful message to him. The man said that he did have some need. So he said, I am a man with a lot of wealth, yet my wife has not given me any children. She's not able to have children, or we are not able to have children. So I wish that you can pray to Allah to provide me with a child. So he asked for a dua in return of the favor. So, so Yaqub, he went and made his ablutions, his wudu, and he prayed as the man requested. Allah answered Yaqub's prayer, and the vill villager was eventually granted four sons. In this way, Yaqub, he was repeatedly reassured by Allah that his beloved son was alive and well. Accordingly, he went and told his sons, he said, uh, I know by the grace of Allah what you do not know. So now Yusuf is aware. I mean, Yaqub is aware of Yusuf. So he tells his sons, I know, I am aware. Allah has made me aware of the, these things. Yusuf has sent me a message. Malikum Mount has, you know, told me he has not seen his soul. <clears throat> so I know what you do not know. So he said, so after another six months went by, uh, Yaqub's family's uh, things that they got from Egypt, those rations, they were running low. So Yaqub sent some of his sons again to Egypt and told them, go and seek out Yusuf and his brother. And don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Only the disbelievers lose hope in the mercy of Allah. You know, Yaqub, he bore the separation uh, with patience, you know, because no matter how hard things get, we should never lose hope in Allah. We see from the ayat, only disbelievers lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Yaqub, you know, he went through that separation. He said, I, my motto is beautiful patience. He never gave up being reunited with Yusuf. And, you know, uh, how are we when we are hoping and praying for the imam of the time to reappear? Think of the separation that Yaqub had with Yusuf. Do we pray for the reappearance of our imam, for the emergence of our imam to come? Do we cry for the separation of our imam? Or have we given up hope on the imam? Are we unconcerned with his affairs? Does it even matter to, we have to ask ourselves, does it even matter to us? Do we even think about it? Is it out of sight, out of mind? Or we're only thinking about what is going on in our day-to-day -day life. Or are we following the example that we find here in the beautiful example of Yaqub, who was practicing beautiful patience? We have to have beautiful patience and waiting for our imam. And we have to be actively working on ourselves while we're waiting for our imam. We have to find what are our duties, what are our responsibilities 
How can we be better servants of the Imam? We have to, we have to know that all the solutions to the problems that we are facing are within the the hur of Imam Zaman Ajallah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif in the reappearance of the Imam in the Imam's governance. Uh, all of these things we will find the solutions to our problems with the coming of the Imam. So we have to pray and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, continuously. And as we go through you know <clears throat> these chapters we see that the importance that the imam has even in the lives of these prophets, how they would pray for uh, using the names of the Ahlu Bayt alayhim salam. And we have to also uh, pray and have patience and beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reunite us with our imam, to bring us together with our imam. As Yaqub was praying to be re reunited with Yusuf alayhi salam. So Yaqub sent his sons to Egypt. He wrote a letter to send with his sons to the Aziz, who had uh, enslaved his son, Benjamin, not realizing that he was writing to his own son, Yusuf. Because he knew Yusuf was alive, but he didn't know Yusuf was the Aziz. He sealed the letter and he gave it to one of his sons. So they arrived in Egypt and they appeared before Yusuf saying, Oh, Aziz. Hard times have come on us and our family. We have come with a few goods to, with which to buy our rations. Nonetheless, we beg you to give us our full ration and be charitable with us by releasing our brother. Allah rewards the charitable. Then they gave him the letter from Yaqub. In the letter, it says, in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, to the Aziz of Egypt, Justice incarnate, who gives in full measure from Yaqub, son of Ishaq, son of Ibrahim, the all merciful's friend. Peace be with you. I praise Allah, other than whom there is no God. We are a family upon whom Allah has always sent tribulation to try us in thick and thin. My grandfather Ibrahim was thrown into the fire because of his obedience to the Lord. And as a result, Allah made the fire cool and peaceful for him. Allah also commanded my grandfather to slaughter my uncle, Ismail, but then replaced him with a ram. For the last 20 years, tribulations have rained down upon me. The first was that I had a son who I called Yusuf. He was the joy and light of my eyes. His half-brother asked me to let him go with them to play in frolic. So I sent him with them in the morning, and they returned to me in the evening crying. They brought me his tunic splattered with fraudulent sheep's blood and claimed that a wolf had eaten him. My grief for his loss was immense and my weeping for his separation from me was intense, so much that it blotted out my vision. He had a brother whom I was pleased. He was my comfort. Whenever I missed Yusuf, I would hug this brother of his to my chest and that would mitigate some of my grief. This son's brother told me that you asked them about him and ordered them to bring him to you. And you threatened to deny them their rations if they failed to bring him. So I sent him to you with them so that they could bring us our wheat rations. But alas, when they returned, he was not among them. They told me that he had stolen your king's goblet. However, I call you to witness that I am no thief. And I did not sire a thief. You have taken him a prisoner and caused me much heartache. My grief over his separation from me is immense, so much that it has weighed down my feeble back. So I beg you to do me a favor and let him go free. Provide us with good wheat and charge us a fair price. Give us our complete ration and quickly release the family of Ibrahim. Yusuf was reading this letter and they it said that they could notice in his face that he was affected by this letter. Obviously, this letter is from his father. He hasn't seen in a long time or heard from in a long time. So he took it from his brother and kissed this letter and touched it to his own eyes. And he wept so much so that his tears fell on the robes that he was wearing. 
And Yaqub's son were very surprised to see him, you know, why is the Aziz doing this? But Yusuf, uh, you know, he ignored his brothers and he composed a reply to his father. And he wrote, be patient as your forefathers were patient and you shall soon prevail as they prevailed. When Yaqub later, when he read this letter, he would say, these are not the words of kings and pharaohs, but of prophets and sons of prophets. So now he is realizing that this letter would be, is not from an ordinary king. These are from sons of prophets. This is from Yusuf, alayhi salam. So Yusuf then turned his attention back to the brothers. And he said, do you remember what you did to Yusuf and his brother and your foolishness? You took Yusuf from his father. You threw him into a well. You plotted to kill him. Then you separated Benjamin from his older brother. And you mistreated him and you made him speak to you as slaves speak to masters. Worse than all this, do you see what you have done to your own father? He said this, uh, he remembered Allah's voice comforting him when he was in that well. You shall soon disclose to them the reality of these deeds of theirs one day when they will not even recognize you. As the clues added up, Allah lifted the veil from the eyes of Yusuf's brothers and they said, are you Yusuf? So he said, yes, I am Yusuf. And this is my brother. Allah has shown us favor. But he wanted to ensure that they finally understood that uh, Allah's favor is not arbitrary, but that anyone who fulfills these prerequisites can attain it. So he said, if anyone is, Allah, is fearing of Allah and he is patient, Allah will show him favor. And Allah does not neglect the righteous. So the brothers, they said, by Allah, he has indeed favored you over us, and we have indeed acted wrongly. Allah told Yusuf in the well that one day he would disclose the reality of their actions that they did to his brothers, and they wouldn't even recognize him. When Imam Zaman, Ajallah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif, reappears, what if we go to him and say, we are your Shia? But he reveals to us all the misdeeds that we have committed. And he says, how can you be a Shia of me when you behave like this? We have to think about this. Because Imam is aware of us. While we are not aware of the Imam, we don't recognize the Imam, but the Imam recognizes us. Why we say he is Yusuf al-Zahra. The same as Yusuf is recognizing his brothers. His brothers think that they, they, this person, the Aziz, has no clue of what they have done in the past. But the Aziz is Yusuf himself, and he knows what they have done. And he has told them, you have done this, and you have done that. And then they said, we have, they admitted to this, and they said, we have indeed acted wrongly. So we have to be careful not to displease our imam because our imam is made aware of our actions and our deeds and he's active in the affairs of the community even though we don't recognize him so we don't want our imam to come and say remember how yusuf said to his brothers remember you did this and you did that and you did this thing and that thing why they thought that he didn't know we don't want our imam to come to us and say this and that and this thing, and that he is aware of these things, and we become ashamed of these things. We have to take our time, especially in this month of Ramadan, to work on ourselves, to find our faults, to search deep down in ourselves and analyze ourselves, find out what we are doing good, find out what we are doing wrong, make action plans to work on what we are doing, inshallah. So they admitted to their wrongdoing and said that Allah has favored you because of your patience and uh, your God-fearingness. So Yusuf said, I will not reproach you again from this day on. May Allah forgive you, for he is the most merciful. Then he tugged at the chain on his neck and he brought a small silver vial out of, out of it and uh, came out of his robes. And this was the same vial that his father had given him before. And this is the same one as uh, coming from 
uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Yusuf opened it and it came out his great grandfather's tunic or his Abba, uh, as we call it, that was given to him by Jibrail to protect him from the fire of Nimrud. So he handed this to his brother uh, Judah and he said, take this tunic of mine, cast it over my father's face and he will see once again. Bring, uh, he said, uh, <clears throat> and bring me your entire family. You, Judah had been the bearer of Yusuf's bloodstained tunic all those years before. Uh, the one where it caused his father to go blind. So he's the one who brought the tunic with the blood on it before from the sheep's blood. So now Yusuf wanted him to be the one who brought this tunic back, which would give sight back to his father and then atone for his past sins. So they filled up their rations and they went back to Yaqub. So when the caravan uh, had only just departed from Egypt, they said their father who was in Canaan, we said that this di distance of this journey was about 18 days. He said to his sons who stayed behind, I swear I can smell the scent of Yusuf. It was the scent of paradise that emanated from the, the Abba or the tunic of Ibrahim alayhi salam that he smelled. And he continued, he said, if you don't consider me as senile, you would believe me. But alas, it says they had still not escaped from the clutches of jealousy. And they thought, and they said thoughtlessly, by Allah, you are still in error in this regard as you have always been. So Jibra'il came to Yaqub and he said, do you want that I teach you a dua, supplication, that which Allah will give you your sight back and he will bring back your sons. So Yaqub, obviously, he's going to say yes to this. So he said yes. He, Jibra'il told him, pray as Adam prayed when he wanted Allah to forgive him. And pray as Nuh prayed when he wanted Allah to bring his ark to rest on the mountain and save him from the flood. And pray as your grandfather Ibrahim prayed when he was thrown into the fire. Say, Ya Allah. As'aluka bihaqqim Muhammad wa Ali wa Fatima wa Hassan wa Hussein. He said, ask Allah by the right. Oh Allah, we ask you by the right of Muhammad, of Ali, of Fatima, of Hassan and Hussein to bring Yusuf and Benjamin back to me and restore my vision. Subhanallah. Uh, we see that Yaqub to get the answer to his dua. As we see the other prophets have prayed and during this uh, course of this book, we'll see that all of the other prophets also prayed similar prayers through the right of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wasalam, those closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have their needs met through them, through tawassal of Ahlul Bayt. Yaqub alayhi salam, he did this like Jibra'il told him. 18 days later, the caravan came from Egypt. Yaqub's household, uh, you know, they wanted to see what is coming, you know, the news that came. <clears throat> so he said, uh, Yaqub's son came back. All of them came back excited. They greeted their father and their families with, the, you know, uh, about the, re the reports about the events that happened in Egypt. And then Judah approached his father with this tunic and spread in his hands. And Yusuf, as Yusuf instructed him, he cast the tunic on his father's face and his sight came back to him. Yaqub, Yaqub he looked at his sons and their, his family for the first time in a long time, in decades. So he told them, did I tell you that I know by the grace of Allah, what you know not. Never again would they dare say that he was in error, for it was made plain to them that he drew his knowledge from a divine source. So we notice uh, here two things <clears throat> from this, that even the earlier prophets from the time of Adam always sought help through the names of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad, alayhi musalam. Many uh, Ahlul Sunnah, they reject this practice of tawassal as shirk, but we can see that it was clearly a practice of Allah's messengers. Uh, second thing, when Yaqub wiped the face 
when Yaqub wiped his face with the tunic of Prophet Yusuf. This is an act we call tabarak, meaning that when you seek blessing through the means of something sacred or something belonging to someone from amongst the ma'asumin, alayhi salam. For example, the, fla the flag that was from the shrine of Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. Marble from the floor of the shrine of Imam Hussein or Abbas or Imam Qadim or one of the Imams uh, or the Prophet. People touch the shrine with their, clo their clothes. And we have almost always, we have a, a famous narration also about the turba of Imam Hussein alayhi salam that it holds shifa, that it holds healing. Because of the, the Imam who is buried in that place, the Imam and the he has barakat. Allah has given shafa especially to this uh, turba. For example, it is forbidden for us to eat dirt, to eat clay. We cannot. It's not for. We cannot do that. But the exception is made for turba of Imam Hussein. In Mafatihu Jannan by Sheikh Abbas Kumi, we find tradition about turba from Imam Ridha alayhi salam, that says whoever uses the tasbih of uh, the turba of Imam Hussein, the clay of Imam Hussein's shrine, repeating the following statements with each bead, Allah Almighty will record for him 6,000 excellent points, erase 6,000 evil doings, raise him 6,000 ranks, decide for him 6,000 times of intercession, Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. If we say these on the turba, Allah will give us these thawab, 6,000 of each of these. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, whoever uses the, the, the tasbih made of the clay of Imam Hussein's shrine or the tomb, imploring for Allah Almighty's forgiveness one time only, will be considered to have implored his forgiveness 70 times. Whoever holds the tasbih in his hand without saying anything shall be considered to have uttered seven statements of glorification for each bead, just holding the tasbih. We see about tabarak, about taking the blessings from relics of prophets, items of prophets, items from imams, Turba of Imam Hussein, all of these things, putting the cloth under the reef, for example, all of these things. We find an interesting story from Imam Askari, alayhi salam, when the Christians were, uh, when there was drought in Samarra, and the, uh, they were praying for rain. Uh, so rain hadn't fallen in a long time. All the crops had died. Uh, people were facing famine. They didn't know what to do. So at that time, Mu'tamad, the Abbasid Caliph in Baghdad, uh, Mu'tamad, he ordered the people to go to the desert and pray for rain. People went to the desert for three days in a row, but nothing fell. No rain came. Next day, the Christians came with their scholars, and they went to offer a prayer and prayed for rain. Uh, when they prayed, it actually rained. So this uh, event that happened, it caused a great uh, disturbance amongst the Muslims. You know, the hearts of the Muslims got attracted towards the religion of Christianity. They said, we prayed for rain, nothing happened, but Allah answered the prayer of the Christians. Maybe we should become Christian now. So the Caliph got very upset about this. Uh, obviously, he was afraid he would lose his power. So he got desperate. So he sent the word to the imam of the time because he knew the answers lie in the house of uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi Even though they are against them, they know that they are the true representatives. So they went to Imam Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam in the prison saying that the religion of his grandfather is in danger. So he summoned him to the court and asked him about the solution to the problem. So our 11th Imam, Imam Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam, said, tell them to go to the desert tomorrow for the sake of rain. So they did, and Imam Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam went uh, with, a with a group of people 
and uh, they were following him and they wanted to disclose and unveil the true matter of this affair. So the Christians raised their hands toward the sky. They prayed to Allah for rain. <clears throat> Not very long and a cloud appeared and it started raining. Imam Askari alayhi salam ordered that the hand of one of those Christians which was raised up be held. Whatever was concealed among his fingers uh, to be taken out. He had something in his hand. Take this out. They observed and they found that this was a bone that was taken out that he was holding on to. And they presented that bone to the imam and the imam, it was wrapped in a piece of cloth. And then the uh, imam told the Christians, now you go and pray for rain to fall. So as soon as the Christian raised his hands to pray, all the clouds that came, they went away. The sun came out, was shining. All the people were surprised, like, what is going on? So Muhammad asked Imam Askari, what was the secret of this? The Imam told him, this is a piece of bone that belonged to one of the prophets of Allah, which they have picked out from his grave. They swear to Allah and ask him for the sake of this bone that belonged to one of their prophet, one of his prophets. And then Allah grants their desire and prayer and makes the rainfall. And whoever holds this bone, the same thing will occur for them. After a test of it the pre in the presence of everybody, uh, what Imam Askari had said proved correct. And they all praised Imam Hassan al-Askari. This way, Imam Hassan al-Askari, he lifted the doubts from the minds of the people that Islam was uh, not the right religion, maybe in Christianity was the right religion. He removed this doubt through this action. And uh, he spread his uh, sajada or his prayer mat and he made two rakat. Then he lifted his bare hands without this bone, bare hands to Allah because he is uh, hujjatullah, the proof of Allah. He raised his hands to Allah and prayed for rain to come and to wipe away the drought. And uh, due to his prayers, they were heard by Allah and they were answered. And rain fell so much that their land became fertile again and all the crops began to grow. The people asked Imam Askari salam, where he lived. Imam Hassan al-Askari pointed at Mu'tamad, the Abbasid Caliph. And he was embarrassed to say that the Imam was his prisoner. So he pointed at the house that he originally lived in before that belonged to Imam Hadi alayhi salam and was forced to release the Imam because of this. And uh, he released him, but only for one year. And the Imam went back to live in the house that he lived in before with his father, Imam Hadi alayhi salam. So we see that this action of things that belong to prophets these things are sacred because of the personality that it belonged to. In this case, they prayed for rain by the sake of this bone that belonged to a prophet. In this case, we're reading in this story of Yusuf, alayhi salam, Ya'qub was healed due to the tunic that belonged to Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salam, and that Yusuf had given him. So we see that this action is called tabarak due to the, the blessings due to the bounty of those individuals uh, who Allah has favored on his earth, such as the prophets of God and Ahlul Bayt alayhi wasalam. So we gain these two lessons from this uh, point. And inshallah, we, have run, uh, we will continue in the next class that we have. Uh, we've run out of time. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Thank you so much. So I think for next two weeks, we don't have a class. And